Welcome to the Not Sorry Art Podcast. I'm Sari Schreik, the artist and creator behind Not Sorry Art and Not Sorry Art School. I'm so excited to talk art and creativity with you. So grab a drink, grab a snack, and let's dive in. Hey y'all, welcome back to the Not Sorry Art Podcast. I'm Sari, thank you for being here. Today's episode is about mistakes. And I know that's a broad subject, but not just about mistakes, but kind of my philosophy on them, that mistakes should not only be tolerated, but actively welcomed. And in my opinion, they can be really great tools for finding focus and purpose in your own creative practice. I'm sure we've all heard the term happy accidents. And I often associated with, of course, Bob Ross. It was like his go-to phrase. I remember loving to watch Bob Ross as a kid. It was, I I had PBS growing up. I had like three channels. And so I got my, my fair share of Bob Ross over the years. And of course I loved his approach, but I think you love something as a kid and then you grow up and you sort of settle into this idea that the real world is harsh and not welcoming to mistakes and I think certainly some of that is true I think our world more and more as our the hours we work kind of balloons and we take on more responsibilities as we grow older and obviously there are criticisms to be made about the pace of our current culture between all those things yes mistakes I feel like have higher and higher stakes to them but I also think that in my own creative practice I've sort of found myself revisiting this idea that mistakes are happy accidents and why would something be a happy accident because it's something that you wouldn't have willfully chose on your own you know to turn this big blob into now this is a happy tree and we're gonna put it in the corner and look there's balance that I wouldn't have been able to think of on my own and I think it can be as simple and as superficial as this process that our dear Bob Ross is describing But in this episode, I want to dive a little deeper into what exactly those happy accidents look like in my own practice, some examples. And if that sounds interesting to you, if you want to learn more about how mistakes can be a guiding force in your own practice, just keep listening. Thanks for being here and let's dive in. I started thinking about the idea for this episode when I stumbled across a TikTok recently, something I do pretty often. And the TikTok was of someone who is a computer programmer who was teaching a programming class to grade school students. And one thing that she noticed was that by the end of this chunk of time that they had devoted to finally making their own code, she went from student to student and she noticed that a trend amongst most of the girl students, and that is that they had absolutely nothing written and the boy students had a ton written. And when she would sit down next to a few of the girl students and ask them what they had worked on during their time, they explained to her that they got frustrated and they didn't know what they were doing. And when she actually started to, you know, ask more questions and say, what do you mean? Can you show me? They were able to hit the undo button and she saw a screen full of code. And what was happening is that these young girl students would rather get rid of something that they weren't super proud of or were unsure of. Of course, these children were learning. But they'd rather get rid of something that they were unsure of versus the boy students who maybe they were more or less sure. Nobody can tell for sure. But they they let their work stay up. And I don't think that this was an example of the boy students being smarter. And the conclusion of the person telling the story was that the girl students were afraid to make something imperfect. In other words, they were afraid to show up with mistakes, despite the fact that they were learning. And I would assume that this was a space where it was understood that everyone was just trying their best. But I think it's really interesting that some people the way they sort of internalize message around making mistakes and being imperfect is that it's just not allowed which is so crazy because as someone who has a creative practice I basically wheel and deal in mistakes I feel like some days I am a professional mistake maker (laughs) and despite our intention and I can only assume the intention of these girl students The act of trying not to make mistakes doesn't, in fact, 
help you get better or get something that's perfect, usually the path to something that we're proud of or something that maybe gets close to whatever perfection looks like in our mind, the only way to get there is through making tons and tons and tons of mistakes. And having this really high threshold for ourselves doesn't make sense in a praxis setting. So it's not to say, you know, whenever we have these conversations around perfectionism, I feel kind of anxious because I think part of the creative process is that some people do have a higher threshold for what they consider finished work, pieces that they want to put their name behind. And I operate out of the mindset of like totally respecting that. So, you know, an example of this in my own practice is I don't call every piece that I make, every piece that comes out of my studio, like a full piece of art. I mostly make studies and these studies can be things that I've worked on for weeks. They can be things that I'm really proud of. But not everything gets the title of a finished piece of fine art. And it it may seem really small on the surface. And I think most people maybe don't even pay attention to that when I hit publish, whether that's on social media or on my website. But what this does for myself is it allows me to sort of have that curatorial space in my own practice where I can be really discerning and I can be critical. Because making good art isn't about shutting down the taste part of yourself, isn't about shutting down the part of yourself that has high standards. It's more allowing yourself to have the breath in your practice, the space in your practice to both make mistakes, make art prolifically enough that then we can sort of curate and have that taste element come into our practice. Basically, what I was just trying to say there is sometimes whenever we come across perfectionists or people who are really anxious around making mistakes, the advice to just lean in, make mistakes, share it, you're human, can kind of feel like when someone is being panicky and someone just says, relax, if only it was that easy, right? And I'm sort of hoping that in this episode, I can really appeal to those people because I think those people are the hardest eggs to crack because I think the ability to be discerning and critical can actually be a superpower. And I think that some of the best artists have a really good eye and are deeply critical of their artwork. But the issue is when that critical eye becomes so overpowering that we don't allow ourselves any space in our entire practice to make something that we cringe at or that we don't like or that's a mistake or that doesn't show our full potential. And another truth to this is that sometimes it can take us months or years or maybe even decades to get to a point where we've made art that really makes our inner critic happy. And there's even, I think, a reality where we never quite make something that makes us happy. I can't tell you the amount of interviews that I've watched. One of my favorite channels on YouTube is called Louisiana Channel, and I'll link it in the show notes, but it's an entire page dedicated to these really wonderful interviews with these master artists, and they are always giving advice. But one thing I've noticed is that there are many artists who, when they're asked, are you proud of something? Do you have a masterpiece? A lot of them will say no. And and it's funny because they're held up for these wonderful works. And so I think if your motivation to coming to peace with your mistakes or having a more forgiving, welcoming practice is just simply to silence that critical part of yourself, I don't know that that's always going to be the best approach for everyone because I think some artists, whether they like it or not, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, who's to say? But having that really critical eye might always be something that they have to contend with. And that's where I'm going to dive into my next point. How do we contend with this? How do we allow ourselves to make and work with that critical eye? Because again, I don't want people to just shut it down and completely ignore it. So for me, a lot of that comes to very intentional goal setting. So a way I think of this is whenever I started my one drawing a day, one painting a day practice back in January of 2016, I had to sort of plea with my inner critic. And this critic had just graduated with a four-year degree in graphic design and fine art. (laughs) This critic had just been exposed to a lot of really fantastic art and was consuming these art magazines. And so my inner critic had become more sophisticated. Again, not inherently a bad thing, but what ended up happening is when I no longer had the tools from my art program to support a practice, the inner critic 
really became strong and my inner praxis, my inner actual artist or craftsperson, wherever you want to look at that as, all of a sudden was atrophying, especially compared to the strength of my inner critic. So anyways, what I had to do was sort of make a plea with myself and say, listen, if you eventually would like to get to a place where you make art you're really proud of, again, like you did in college, you're going to have to allow me to make these other goals. And so one of the goals was just quantity over quality. And that's not necessarily a great long-term goal, I think. I mean, who who's to say? At least for me, it wasn't. But what this allowed me to do is it sort of helped me to build the infrastructure. And that sounds really fancy, but what I, I mean by that is just make it normal in my own practice and routine and my space with my partner and my physical studio space it made it possible to where that was expected. I was going to show up. I was going to set aside time every day to paint. I was going to take over a corner of the living room every day for an hour. Granted, this didn't immediately yield good art because I didn't have the time or space or resources, but it helped me to make art, period. I had to ask my inner artist for some patience and it requires, you know, I think there's a misconception that whenever you push yourself and you start something that requires consistency, that you're just so determined and you're just gritting it out. But really the motivating factor in the discipline it takes to keep up a creative practice, to improve your skill and to show up and to become the artist you want to be is really a lot of patience and self-love. <laughs> I know that sounds like hokey pokey, but I totally mean it. I think it's not just white knuckling. It's not just bearing down. It's not just like being so critical to the point where you make good art. That's just not how that happens. Whenever I think of that approach where you're so critical that you just, you do make good art. I think of trying to squeeze like a wet bar of soap. Like the more pressure you put, sort of the more you lose your, your goal. You can't quite grip it. It's pressure ends up being kind of a negative factor and this is certainly what I found in my own practice and as I've told the story numerous times over social media over the last almost decade I have heard it echoed in other people that it was through sort of relaxing and being kind to yourself and tolerating maybe not the best art that they were able to sort of put the wheels in motion and create a practice that allowed the space to become better and to make good art. Which brings me to sort of my next point, because I think for most people, simply just creating the space and showing up certainly does a lot of the work. And I think initially when you get started with a creative practice or you're really leveling up your creative practice, that is a lot of the work. But just like someone can drive to work every single day and not become a NASCAR driver, (laughs) you can have a practice where you sort of show up every day. And unless you're sort of doing some really deep investigative work and really learning from your mistakes and having these hard conversations around what you like about your work, what you don't like about your work and how to get better. Everyone's different, but there's, I think, a tendency. I've seen artists who kind of just putter out at a certain point. And again, I want to preface this by saying like, if the artist is happy with this, it's not to say that you need to develop some great skill or certainly you don't need to paint representationally, but more so I'm speaking to people who, all right, they set up their practice, they've quieted their inner critic and now they're sort of in this autopilot phase. Like how do we take that kind of a practice? How do we specifically, in regards to this episode, learn from those mistakes to help us sort of grow and change and evolve and expand as artists? And the way I think of this next part is learning how to play ping pong with the universe. (laughs) So what I mean by this is instead of fighting your mistakes, instead of just trying to be so good at executing whatever you have in your mind, instead of just trying to follow the roadmap that you can think of in, in your mind's eye or however that looks for you, whether it's like coming up with it in Procreate and then making it on a canvas, whatever that looks like for you, instead of just trying to stick to the script, and make exactly what you have in your mind. Allowing yourself to develop space within your practice that when you inevitably deviate from this, usually that comes in the form of an accident or a mistake. Whenever you deviate, instead of being critical and rushing to, oof, I messed up, how do I fix this? How do I go back and try it again and and not make that mistake? That might be the solution. But instead of jumping straight to that, can you ask yourself if this is something 
that might help or improve your practice? Can this teach me something? And the reason I say ping pong is because you don't know, like everyone knows that you're going to make mistakes, but whenever you make those mistakes, can you ask if this is an opportunity for you to create something that you wouldn't have created on your own? So one of the ways this can look for me is I really struggle (laughs) with the drawing aspect of being an artist. So I paint representationally. Not everyone has to, obviously. But I like to. I I like that I can sort of talk to everyone when I paint representationally. And I like the challenge of finding beautiful images. Beautiful if they were abstract, beautiful in realism. And staying tethered to realism and trying to make those beautiful abstract color choices. It's a fun game for me. Anyways, but what ends up happening is because I'm sort of tethered to representational art, drawing often for me is a big tell. And what I've learned to do is sometimes I've begun to realize that a certain amount of wonkiness can be really endearing. I've learned that if I draw something and it becomes way too large or out of proportion, if I go back over it, sometimes the conversation that I was having before the initial drawing of the house or the tree or the hand or whatever if I leave a little bit of it and I cover it up and sort of revise what I have learned is I really like that because I like art where people can see what I'm doing so because of these mistakes I had to ask myself why do I need to cover it up is it because I don't want people to think I make mistakes is it because it's distracting from the story I'm telling and I came to the conclusion that I actually don't mind if people see my thinking through my art and as I've grown and developed as an artist it's something that I've really intentionally woven into my art I like when people can see me thinking I like when a painting from a little bit of a distance looks maybe a little bit seamless and nice and perfect and then you get up close and you can see all these mistakes and edits and revisions and I like hiding them to where it's really a treat for when you see it in person or really close up and this is something that had I really adhered to this I'm not going to make mistakes because I don't want to look like a newbie painter or I don't want to look unskilled had I stayed tethered to that which was my initial ambition graduating freshly from college I don't know that I would have found something that has become very key to my style. And you know what? Even more important than that, something that I derive a ton of pleasure in. And this is just one example. There are probably so many examples within your own practice where you should pump the brakes on the desire to not make mistakes and think about what happens if you just make those mistakes again you probably can't control that that you just make a mistake and pause and ask yourself why do I want to fix this and you know I don't want to get too in the weeds here but if the only way you're operating out of is this desire to prove that you're a good picture maker I think that's fine but I would ask you to sort of maybe pause that line of thinking because I think there there's more depth to what we're doing with our art than just making good pictures. I think, you know, like going back to my example, showing that I'm a better editor than a painter for me is a really fun thing that I like to engage in. And obviously I'm, I'm talking specifically about being a representational painter and abstract painters are going to have different things. But when you ask yourself about this mistake and, you know, can you leave it? Can you play with it? Or another thing is, is it teaching you something? Is it teaching you that maybe you don't want to paint this level of representation? Is it teaching you that maybe you don't want to do this kind of abstraction? Could it be, if we zoom out a little bit, a bigger clue as to where we want to go with our artwork? An example of this in my own practice is I remember when I graduated from college, I painted a ton of architectural landscape paintings. I loved it. I still really enjoy it. But I remember I really struggled with painting the flora, the bushes, the trees, anything that was plant life. I tended to really struggle with and I found that it was starting to make me choose different compositions. So there would be a scene of like a gas station or something and it would have this big beautiful palm tree in front of it and sort of this ratty bush growing right outside of a a trash can or something and I loved it I loved the image I loved the way the plants were encroaching in on the space but I was finding that because it contained things that I was really uncomfortable drawing and I didn't want to make mistakes that I would either crop it differently or zoom in and I had to eventually ask myself why am I doing this why am I allowing 
my mistake avoidance to make design decisions for me. It felt like all of a sudden, instead of learning how to play with my mistakes, and again, going back to that metaphorical ping pong, instead of that, I was letting it bully me around. I wasn't responding to it other than I was completely changing what I was doing. So it was it was a game that I was not comfortable with. It was a motivation that if I thought about it, And I could get through the discomfort of making something that was possibly ugly and posting something online that maybe wasn't up to my standard. If I could just get through that initial discomfort, I found that I was really not happy with that creative decision. And so one thing I had told myself was that I was just going to jump in and start painting a lot more botanicals. And this started my whole botanical series. And obviously working on your mistakes, working on something that you struggle with doesn't have to be come like this whole other body of work for me it started out with greenhouses because greenhouses had enough architecture to them that I was still a little bit in my comfort zone but obviously the bulk of the subject was succulents and philodendrons and all kinds of beautiful lush botanicals that I had really never painted before but even if all you do is a small study and you just become comfortable now you have the space in your practice to paint whatever you want again. But also going back again to that ping pong, I responded to being frustrated with my mistake avoidance bullying me around by diving right in feet first into something I was afraid of. And the way the universe sort of ping ponged that back to me was that I found a whole different body of work that I really loved and enjoyed. And if all I had been doing is operating out of mistake avoidance, I would have never found a body of work that I ended up really loving. So with these two examples, you have an instance where you sort of learn to allow the mistakes. This is a la Bob Ross with his, you accidentally smudged some black on your sky. Why don't we turn that into a tree? Wow, how unexpected. That's one way you can sort of whack the ball back to the universe, right? If you're playing, again, this sort of uh, (laughs) metaphorical ping pong, you can sort of say, okay, didn't expect that. Wouldn't have ideally put that smudge there, but now we're going to turn it into a treat. And you can hit eject at any time. You can sort of scrape off the paint or let it dry and start over and decide you don't want to do that. That's still a great lesson to learn, but you can sort of allow the mistake and re- examine what you envisioned in your mind the other thing is you can sort of another way you can hit the ball back to again our metaphorical universe is you can say I really want to paint this well I don't want to have blobby bushes they're distracting from what I'm going to do and you can move your practice in a way where you learn and you dive in and you teach yourself how to do a better job at whatever it is that you have envisioned Obviously, I really like the ping pong metaphor. <laughs> it's kind of my go-to. I've tried to use it in interviews. It's just, it's a long-winded way of describing it. But that's, that's my preferred method of thinking about my own mess-ups in my studio, my own mistakes and shortcomings is, again, instead of just like over-dramatizing it and making it feel like it's the nail in the coffin and I was never going to be a good artist, look at all these mistakes. You know, I've really breathed a lot of joy and levity into my practice by just saying okay it's just it's just me playing with the universe and it's just unexpected and how boring would it be if I controlled every aspect of my practice that's just sort of one of the main ways that I process it another way you can sort of think about your mistakes and contextualize and reframe it is you can treat your mistakes and shortcomings and all the ways that you deviate from the plan in your head as the universe being your teacher I teach Not Sorry Art School and one of the things I'm always trying to do in my practice that I find actually pretty challenging is coming up with ways to challenge my students. So obviously whenever I'm building a curriculum I explain sort of a concept and the vocabulary and then my next step is to come up with exercises or challenges or show a challenge where a student might feel a little bit outside of their comfort zone And as a teacher, that's a big part of your job, right? Is to sort of stretch the students as much as you can, make them uncomfortable because you learn new things when you're sort of pushed outside of your comfort zone. I think the universe can do a really great job of stretching you and moving you around if you let it, if you don't simply avoid mistakes, if you, going back to the top of the podcast, are more like the little boy students who are sort of allowed to be brave and make mistakes and mess up and not have it affect their own identity. An example of this might be 
that you're working on a body of work that you've enjoyed for years and you're starting to get a certain level of mastery around and all of a sudden you wake up one day and it's just not fulfilling. It's not exciting and you don't know why and you're not doing anything wrong and what's going on? Do I just keep pushing through? And again, like with the whole theme of this episode, I really don't think there's one solid way to answer this, but it's your opportunity to sort of sit with this new reality and say, do I need to grow? Do I need to challenge things? Do I need to push through? Like, what does this look like? And if all you're doing is operating out of mess avoidance, out of avoiding starting something new and looking stupid, then you might find yourself sort of trapped in a way that a more authentic and curious part of yourself doesn't want to be. So, I mean, mistakes can look (laughs) as obvious as you put a blob on your canvas or, you know, it can be all of a sudden one day you wake up and a body of work that was working for you is no longer serving you. And I think the reason why both of those things can be scary is because a formula that had worked, something that had been planned out in your head, something that you envisioned to go one way, all of a sudden goes another. And that can be incredibly scary as an artist. But I think that being an artist that's the core of what we do that's kind of what makes having a practice so special especially compared to everything else in our lives I don't know about you guys, but for me, it feels like the margins of which I can make errors in my everyday life feel so narrow. I have young children and every parental decision I make, I carry with a heavy heart and I really, really, really stress about messing up. In contrast to a lot of the other aspects of my life, my own studio is sort of a reprieve from all of those things. I think that's why like, I've grown to really have this super duper benevolent feeling towards my mistakes and my mess ups I mean of course I'm human if I have like a week where every single thing I do I seem to just fumble and not get right does that eventually grate on my nerves sure but I think I also recognize that a creative outlet is a space for you to be able to make those mistakes and not have them feel quite so big and weighty and being able to problem solve without feeling like the floor is going to cave in I think is something really special that all humans deserve but if you're someone who has the space and is lucky enough to have a creative practice I would really encourage you to not let that sort of risky mistake avoidance type mindset to leak into your creative practice because again I think what's so special about a creative practice is that you can make mistakes and it is okay and you can learn from them and it can actually shape the way you work in your career and make you a better artist because of those mistakes and to wrap this all up I wanted to talk about the course I'm releasing February 27th This mistake mindset, this mistake tolerant, this mistake welcome sort of mindset is something that I've had within my own practice pretty much forever. But once I started Not Sorry Art School, I became incredibly intentional with it. The style of painting that I learned in college had a lot of redraw lines and layering in it. And so it was already a way of painting that sort of was had mistakes built into it and it was totally fine it it was acrylic so you could just paint on top of it and whenever I started teaching not sorry art school what I wanted to have in that course was the space to let other people who maybe were really intimidated by art and and knew that their skills weren't great obviously if you're signing up for an online art course you're there to improve your skill and so something I came right out of the gate with was this idea around mistakes and it's okay to make them and it's just going to make your painting more interesting and allow yourself the time and space to make those, learn from them, keep moving forward. And what I found is the students have responded to that by saying that it's made them quicker and fast obviously doesn't mean better, but I feel like as far as being a student and learning, the quicker you can sort of get through something and aren't held back or paralyzed by mistake avoidance, you know, the quicker you can sort of improve. And again, you don't have to be fast, but if the fast is the speed at which you're moving is a byproduct of not being paralyzed by fear, I think that that's always kind of a win. So with this new course coming out, I wanted to dedicate a whole section to mistakes. And I did this by teaching a nightmare still life. I had all of the things that my students said that they tried to avoid, things like patterns, multiple light sources, translucent objects, mirrored objects, hands in there. So all kinds of really fun stuff. And the course is also paired with a pep talk section where I talk through different ways you can sort of troubleshoot these mistakes and how you can learn to 
work with them, modify them. Again, going back to my metaphor, playing ping pong with it and having you walk away from your practice, ultimately better, more confident, braver, more resolved than you went into your creative practice. I hope this was a helpful episode. I wanted to bring to you guys a reframing device that has really helped me in my practice. I feel like so many of us know, okay, mistakes aren't bad. I need them to grow. But sometimes having a tool that really reframes it for you can be really helpful. Come up with your own metaphor, whatever works for you. I really like the ping pong one because it sort of allows how I respond to my artwork to be as much of a fuel as my intention that I initially set for my artwork. And for me, that unexpected quality makes my practice really fun. It's going to be different for everyone. Some people relinquish a lot of control to mistakes in the process and other people choose to relinquish less control and like I said earlier in the episode that's okay we all have different levels of scrutiny and a critical eye and I think that that's totally fine and it makes you who you are but I want you to be kinder to yourself and allow yourself the space to mess up and make artwork that you're not totally happy with and learning how to respond to that I think makes us all better artists versus just white knuckling our way through until we finally get a work that reflects what we have in our mind. I really hope that you walk away from this a little bit more calm, your shoulders lower, and remember that if you make a mistake that that can be a lesson, a sign from the universe or however you conceptualize it. And it doesn't always need to be a bad thing and it certainly doesn't need to be something that you actively run from. Thank you for listening. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. And as always, happy creating. Hey all, I just wanted to let you know that I'm hosting a painting retreat March 22nd through 27th in the beautiful Texas hill country of Wimberley, Texas. I'll be teaching my still life and landscape techniques as we relax on a 100-acre property situated 45 minutes away from downtown Austin. There are five unique lodging accommodations to choose from plus a drive-in option for local guests. We'll be enjoying chef-prepared meals, so every single meal of the day is already provided for you, and soak in all the inspiration that the beautiful property has to offer. And y'all, if you haven't been down to the Texas Hill Country, it is so stunning. All the locals vacation out there. It's a lot of beauty and nature and hopefully we're going to be super inspired by that as we learn plein air painting and lots of other great technique. So sign up today by heading over to my website sari.studio and clicking the Texas Painting Retreat tab. I hope to see you there. It's going to be a blast. And I wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone who took the time to leave reviews. Not only is this really helpful because I get to see how you guys are reacting to the podcast, but it helps my podcast get found on the podcast app. I'm a newer podcast, and so any help is really, really, really appreciated. So this week, I would like to say thank you to SHR Illustration. That's at S-H-R-I-L-L-U-S-T-R-A-T-I-O-N. I also wanted to say thank you to Not Impressed by Your App. I like that handle. It's all spelled how it sounds. And thank you to Amai Ulari. That's at A-M-A-I-U-L-L-A-R-I. Thank you again so much for your feedback. And if you would like to have your Instagram handle or your name read off on next week's episode, just make sure to leave a review. Again, I'm always really appreciative of those. So thank you again so much. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and happy creating.